The UK physical landscape has the reputation, rightly so, of changing very quickly in appearance from one place to the next. By world standards, the country has an amazing mixture of landforms and relief inside a very small area. The maximum variety in the minimum distance. In this programme, we're going to see one of the best examples in the UK of how landscape changes over short distances by following a river in the north of England from its source to its mouth. You wouldn't call it a famous river, but in its short 100 kilometer journey to the sea, it has some superb pieces of physical geography common to many river basins in the UK. In fact, this river is in many ways pretty special. It's the Tees in northeast England. Like most rivers in Britain, the Tees starts off in one of the most desolate environments in the country, the moorlands. In this case, the moorlands of Cumbria, not far from the border with County Durham. There aren't actually that many rivers in the UK which start off in dramatic environments, tumbling out of beautiful rocky mountainsides. More often than not, their source is a big soggy mass like this. These areas certainly get the UK record for damp and gloom. The altitude here is about 600 metres, temperature and sunshine figures are very low and just over there is the crest of the Pennine Hills which catch the full force of depressions moving in from the Atlantic. <laughs> With annual rainfall at 1,200 millimetres these bogs never dry out. They soak up water like a sponge. For well over half the year, the moorland sponge is unable to hold on to the huge amounts of water that fall on it. It lets it go via a network of trickles and rivulets that eventually combine to become what's recognisable as a stream. This programme was shot at the end of March. On the second day of filming, the depths of winter returned in full force to the moorlands at the source of the Tees. A very active cold front swept across the crest of the Pennines. The temperature plummeted 8 degrees and 10 centimetres of snow were dumped on the ground in just a couple of hours. At this altitude, just a few hundred metres downstream from the soggy moorland summits, the Tees is still a very narrow stream. But it's already starting to cut a V-shaped valley at certain spots and it's carrying quite a lot of sediment the material that it's forced out of the land surface on its way down. The sediment carried by a river is usually divided into three different types. Firstly, the solute load. That's the material that's been chemically dissolved into the water. Second, the suspended load. Those are the minute particles which are carried along by the river and often give the water a murky look. Thirdly, the bed load. That's the larger material like this. Let's forget the big boulders for a minute and take a shovel full of bed load that looks a bit more average. 
not very scientific, I know, but we'll prepare it with samples taken from further downstream. Like me, if you live in the southeast of England, in lowland Britain, you may have no idea of just how extensive these upland areas are. In the UK as a whole, one estimate says that the moorland environment covers a quarter of the country. As the Tees flows down through its moorland section, however, it's not long before you come across the first artificial thing in the landscape, a reservoir. Reservoirs are very common in the upland sections of UK rivers. They store water for urban areas and industries farther downstream, where rainfall figures are low and water can often be scarce. The water company doesn't only control the reservoir, they also decide how much water to allow into the river at any one time. They try to imitate what would be happening naturally, and in March, that means the highest flow of the year. The Tees is now really up and running with high levels of erosive energy. This spot is only five kilometers from the source of the Tees, but already there's nothing sharp left in the river. Every piece of the bedlow has had its corners knocked off, smooth and rounded by the erosion that's happened so far. It's in this section that erosion is at its most powerful. The downward gradient plus the high volume of water and bed load have enabled the Tees to cut several steep V-shaped sections. As the river drops to about 350 metres above sea level, the wild moorland environment begins to peter out and more and more space is taken up by farmland. At this altitude, practically all of it is pasture used to raise cattle and sheep. With meadows in the valley floor and the steep V-shape on the valley sides, as the river sweeps downstream in broad curves, the Tees is beginning to excel as a piece of top-notch scenery. But of all the superb features that rivers contribute to the landscape, maybe none can match the beauty of these. The Tees has a flow rate of 20 cubic metres a second. It's only at a place like this that you get a real idea of how much water that actually is. The high force waterfall. The key to the formation of a waterfall, and this goes for 90% of waterfalls worldwide, is rocks. And here, at high force on the Tees, the river runs across a rock called Windstone. The Windstone isn't just the key to the waterfall. It has some unexpected links with other geographical features in northern England. One of them is well worth a quick detour. The Windstone is an igneous rock that squeezed its way upwards towards the Earth's surface 300 million years ago, in a very thin layer, rather like the filling in a sandwich. Once it had cooled, like most volcanic rocks, it was extremely hard. Much harder than all the other rocks in the area. So, following millions of years of erosion, the windstone stands above the average level of the North England countryside. This turned out to be a very useful geographical quality to a famous historical figure. His name was Hadrian, and he was a Roman emperor. On a trip to the north of England in 122 AD, he noticed that the windstone stuck up above the landscape and he ordered a wall, Hadrian's Wall, to be built on it. It became the heavily guarded frontier of the Roman Empire, with a superb high-level view of any possible invading army out across the landscape to the north. Right, back to the windstone at high force. So we've got windstone, but very important, there's a second rock at high force. 
And it's the difference in hardness that's crucial in understanding how the waterfall came about. In this cross section, the windstone is the darker layer of rock on top. It's so hard that the river can't wear it away. The lighter layer of rock underneath is the softer one that I've just smashed with the hammer. It gets slowly worn away by the water swirling at the base of the falls. It's pretty obvious what's going to happen. And this simple process will, of course, happen again and again. The end result is that the waterfall actually moves upstream from the spot where it started. As it does so, another landform is created. A gash in the landscape with very steep sides and a river at the bottom. A gorge. And a gorge is exactly what lies immediately downstream from the waterfall at high force. Not far from the falls, the Tees leaves its steep upland section and broadens out. As the altitude drops, temperatures rise. Rainfall is lower and agriculture is easier. Farmland now occupies 95% of the valley. Most rivers are at their most powerful just at the point where they leave their upland sections. The amount of energy in the river is linked to how much water, how fast it's flowing and how steep the river's course. 95% of a river's energy is lost through friction with the bed, the banks, obstructions and vegetation. That leaves only 5% for carrying out erosion and transporting the bed load. The sum total of a river's energy gradually declines as it moves downstream. One result is that it can't carry the larger pieces of bed load that it was able to shift in its upper section. In the middle section, the size of the fragments is smaller. Just over halfway down from the river's source, the feeling of being in a valley has completely disappeared. The lowlands of the floodplain extend for 10 kilometers or so on either side of the river. With the climate getting warmer all the time, Agriculture now includes arable crops, like oilseed rape. On this stretch, the Tees does another one of its classic pieces of physical geography. Meanders. Meanders of all shapes and sizes. Meanders can crop up anywhere along the course of a river, but they are always much more frequent, larger and more curvy in the lower reaches. In the flat, lower section of a river, meanders are constantly changing their position. At this particular spot, it's possible to project what's going to happen next. Maximum erosion is on the outside of the bends, where the water is running fastest. The shape of the meander therefore develops like this. Result, the meander gets cut off, leaving a feature known as an oxbow lake. One of the Teaser's meanders encloses a whole town, the town of Yarm. 250 years ago, it used to be the most important port on the Tees. It's only 18 kilometers from the sea as the crow flies. But it was a struggle for ships to get this far upstream. There were so many meanders between the coast and Yarm, the bigger ships had to be pulled by horses trudging along the towpath. But Yarm was the Tees' most important port for a very long time. There was shipbuilding and sailmaking here, and farm produce was exported to London and the European mainland. Yarm has never made it as a modern industrial centre. For the most part, it has stayed where it always was, inside its own personal meander. What killed off Yarm's commercial future was this. A bridge built across the river much nearer the sea, around which grew up the town of Stockton. Stockton became one of the centres of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. 
In the early days of Stockton's growth, though, the town's Victorian businessmen weren't 100% happy with the teas. There were still too many meanders between the port and the sea, a time and money-wasting problem. The Victorians weren't exactly environmentally minded. In fact, they often regarded nature as something that got in their way. The solution, therefore, to the problem of the tea's meanders was straightforward. They chopped two of them off by building a brand new dead straight three kilometer channel. The original natural course of the river has disappeared. So from here, as far as the eye can see, the tease is completely artificial. And so is the whole of the landscape in the river estuary. These last few kilometers of the Tees before it enters the sea were once a huge marshland. In its middle and upper sections, the river was powerful enough to carry large fragments in its bedload. But here in the lower section, the river can only carry and deposit the finest material. Time for the last bedload sample. And I think I know what we're gonna get here. Estuary mud. 30 or so years ago, there was a boom in heavy industries, looking for lots of space, lots of water, and easy access to the sea. The estuary mud was dried out and reclaimed, and a whole range of new industries was developed. North Sea oil terminals, petrochemical works, a nuclear power station, and, biggest of all, an iron and steel works. The biggest requirement for space on the steelworks site is the stockyard, where the three basic raw materials for steel are kept, iron ore, limestone and coal. Even here, surrounded by the landscapes of heavy industry, things all really focus on the river. The tease is crucial to the steelworks operation. 90% of the plant's raw materials are brought in by huge ships from locations all around the world, and the river is deep enough to accommodate them. On this particular day, the last river landscape on the Tees before it enters the sea features a 150,000 tonne coal carrier from northwestern Australia. Such is the end of a 100 kilometer trip that started in a soggy mass high on the Pennine Hills. It's been 15 degrees today down here on the estuary. But someone's just told us that it snowed again up on the moors at the river's source. What did we start off by saying about the landscape along the Tees? The maximum variety in the minimum distance.